Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. A warm welcome to celebrate with us the launch of my new book, Homo Automaticus Embracing Our AI Driven Evolution. I'm so happy to have you with us here on this very, very special day. Now it is available worldwide on the Amazons as an ebook. Uh, paperback version and a hardcover version, but more on the details later. So what is the book about and why did I write it and what can you expect from the book? And of course, where you can find it, we've talked about this a little bit later, but we will go in detail to all these questions. I grew up in my parents' bookstore. That sounds pretty romantic, but actually it wasn't. And it led me to being a very pretty nerdish young boy. And so I was dedicated to try first AI algorithms on my very first computer, Commodore 64. That was a very long time ago. But since then, AI was something like a companion for me and the idea of automating our tasks, my tasks, stayed with me nearly my whole life. And the other point I was very, very clear at the age of 15 was I would like to be a good father for my children. And I want to be there for my children and I want to stay and spend time with them. So. I've been an entrepreneur for the last 15 years and I implemented a lot of automation and recently a lot of AI into my business to free a lot of time. So a lot of things I talk and write about in this book, I've tried myself and I'm using AI as a driving factor in my business for the last decade. So I'm personally very, very happy for this AI spring we observe right now. I don't know if we are yet in the AI summer and I definitely know that the harvest of AI is still some years ago, but we are right now in a very, very warm AI spring. And this you can see in all aspects of our life. And we will go in detail in a minute. So yes, one of my purposes that drives me is to free time, a lot of time to stay present in my family, to, yeah, to, to have very, very good pleasure and quality time with my family. My AI told me to write this book. Yes, I talk a lot with AI, but no, this is not true. No AI told me to write the book. That was my impetus, my idea, my will to talk about all the very, very important aspects of AI in business, in our life, in research and so on. So right now it is exploding. Whenever you enter your feed on social media or your New York Times app or whatever news feed you're addicted to, you read another new story about AI some sad and bad stories and some very glorious and happy ones. So there's a lot of buzz around these days and it is becoming very, very difficult to pick up the, the diamonds in the dust to decide to tell which of all these stories is true and which one is good for you and which one could help you. A lot of people are riding this bullet train of AI these days. And one of my intentions as I wrote the book was to give you a companion to tell what is good, what is true, what is bad, and how to embrace these rapidly changing times with AI. Your companion, the book that accompanies you in all aspects and helps you to decide which of these AI stories is true or better, which could help you, which could foster your life, your business. Okay, so this is why 
I wrote the book. But why now? Why is there such an explosion of AI topics, of new inventions in the area of AI and a lot of other technology fields? I am really sure you have heard about the exponential age. And we are living right now in the exponential age. But this started very, very long time ago. So some 600 years ago from now and actually some 600 kilometers south of here where I'm talking to you all began with this. In the Middle Ages, information was only be able to copy it by monks, by monks in monasteries. And um, as I learned in my studies at university, an average monk could write an average of 20 pages per day. That was the speed with which information could be copied and given to other people. And then Johannes Gutenberg invented the letterpress. That was in 1438. And now all of a sudden, 3,000 400 pages, 3,600 pages per day could be copied. You don't have to pull out your calculator right now. I've done the math for you. And this is a factor of 180. So the speed with which information was copied, 180x to the state before. And that gave the beginning of this exponential curve of our humankind development. So a little bit later than the invention of the letterpress, the telephone was invented in 1878. And then uh, two decades later, uh, the transistor radio was invented, the transistor in 1938, and the internet finally came up in 1969. And then things happened really, really fast and things began to go exponentially. This curve ends 10 years ago, 2014, and we are almost vertical and we are right now in a vertical development. So while you are listening, watching the launch of Homo Automaticus here, new inventions, new ideas are made there outside. So manana or right now, when you open up your feed, you will see more new inventions and it is nearly at a speed of, of light that new inventions are happening and new ideas come up every second. And this will never go slower anymore. Toto, um, it's all the opposite. It will go faster and faster. And next week it will be faster and next year it will be faster again. So we're talking about a vertical development here. Okay, yes, of course, if you're a mathematician, mathematician uh, you will tell me there is nothing faster than a vertical curve, but I can tell you there is. This will go faster and faster every day. But don't worry, you have the companion here. Okay, so we have the development from our ancestors growing for the first time the plants on the acres to right now using the same silicon to develop very, very breathtaking ideas and a very big booster for humanity. Okay, but I think we'll have to talk about the elephant in the room, don't you? But in nowadays, it's not just a single elephant, it's all a herd of elephants. So there are pretty much a lot of them. And we have to address them one by one. So here comes elephant number one. Elephant number one is the saying that AI will take our jobs, your job, my job here as a keynote speaker, as an author and so on. And there's a very public saying these days, not AI will take your job, but somebody using AI will. And I couldn't disagree more. I don't think so. I don't think that somebody using AI will take your job. I think somebody with a very huge understanding of the whole universe of AI driven forces, that person is going to take your job unless you are well prepared and you know 
what the coming wave will be. And of course, Homo Automaticus is your companion to stay ahead of this wave and to be totally prepared. So don't worry. And I am really, really convinced that AI gives us a lever that is very, very huge. And so our efficiency, our self-efficacy will tremendously increase using AI. I see this every day when I apply and use AI in my daily business. And so nobody of us should fear that he or she will be displaced by AI. I've brought to you some examples that will make it very clear. But before, let us go back in time, not 600 years this time, only 100 years. Imagine a very sunny spring afternoon in the April of 1924. You're going to make a call, let's say from Manhattan to Brooklyn or from Hamburg to Berlin or wherever you are placed. And for this call, you have to call the operator and to tell the very friendly woman, mostly women, from the operator where you're going to call. Okay, please, ma'am, could you um, could you play, make me a call to Brooklyn 664 or please put me a call to Berlin 220. And then this operator tried their very, very best to connect you as fast as possible. But as I've seen in some statistics, you normally had to wait until 30 minutes until your phone call to the other end of the city or to another city was ready to being operated. Okay, now we are able in our times in April 24, within a couple of seconds to conduct a Zoom or a Teams conference, all this video and audio and so on with screen sharing all in the same moment. To have this, we had to fire thousands of thousands of telephone operators. I ask you, hmm, would you like to turn back time and to go back in time to these days of telephone operators to have back these working places, but to have the inconvenience to wait until half an hour to get your call operated? I don't think so. And this is just one small example where we see that, of course, there are strong shifts in the work environment with new technologies, but this is nothing new. This happened the last 100 to 200 years, and we've always created more jobs than we have destroyed by new technologies. We see this in the highly industrialized companies, countries like Sweden, Germany, or South Korea, where we have a very, very high level of robots working in the industries, and we see really, really low unemployment. So new jobs are created out of new technologies. But it is really important to have a clear idea what is your business. When you're a photographer, is your business to operate a camera, to know the lenses and the focus and so on, and all the technical details on how to operate a camera to have a good image? Or is your business to know in which circumstances you could use an image. What does an image communicate? Where to place an image like this one or, play, or where to place another one? So this is the very core question for all of us. This is also for me. I'm, I am an author. I'm a keynote speaker. What is my core business? Right now, I would say to inspire you to use AI in your life, in your business, to stay ahead of the wave. But maybe this changes in the couple of years. Okay, this is another example. With the upcoming e-mobility, with e-cars, there won't, and autonomous vehicles, AVs, there won't be use of gas stations anymore. Or is there? Is the core business of all the petrol companies, is it to give us petrol or is it maybe to have a station on the road to rest to 
buy a magazine or yeah okay this is <laughs> a little bit outdated or to buy some sweets or whatever it could be but petrol companies have to think about that core business a lot to stay ahead and not to be disrupted by the coming wave of new technologies so this was elephant number one now elephant number two and this is also a very very important one when we talk about ai a lot of people these days tell me that okay tim i think ai is very good for humanity and i think i know how to use it but with all the deep fakes i encounter in my daily ingested media stream what do i do i can't trust the media anymore and i tell you hmm okay when could you trust the media uh, actually that stopped also some 100 years ago when some really really artistic photographers began to manipulate photographs that were published in the newspaper and you couldn't really trust the news anymore so all of us developed an idea of what is a viable source of information what is not and what is the idea of information and media you would like to ingest in your feed it's not in vain called feed last week we saw a very very healthy movement when princess kate of england told us that she suffered from cancer and there was a huge wave in the social media on the social media platforms that didn't believe this news and they all thought and argued that this photograph you see here is not true it is there's something missing her husband is missing and so on so it was very obvious at this point that the vast majority at least from the people being active on social media that they don't trust and that they have a very clear idea of what could be a photograph or a video of trust and what not i think we are right now very we are we have ripened and we know how to tell if media is true or not and another case is russian dictator vladimir putin a couple of weeks ago he told in the news that uh, there was some avatar of him present and that the russian population shouldn't trust this avatar so this topic is gaining of interest and i think we will be able very soon to to have very clear which sources to trust and which not it's also a question of common sense okay so let us address elephant number three which one could it be of course this is it who is in the driver's seat? Who is really in the driver's seat when we live a lot with AI and AI agents? More and more people are shifting their searches from Google to bots like Perplexity AI or chatbots like ChatGPT or Claude and they trust on that bot and more and more we see AI agents handle tasks for us and even book a flight on our behalf or buy something in an e-commerce store and so on so a lot of things are going on a lot of a lot of handlings and it is done by the ai on our behalf are we still in the driver's seat i think so as i think it is it is us working and commanding the ai not the ai commanding us but it is a very interesting topic and a very good colleague of mine oliver leise and me are writing right now our news book and this will be called age of agents and oliver founded the seymour futuristic institute he's a very renowned futurist and i like a lot working with him as we throw ideas forth and back and we think from all sides from 360 degrees on this topic so stay tuned to when the book will be published okay now the fourth 
and last elephant before we say goodbye to the elephants here the fourth one this is a huge one i have to admit okay the fear that ai might take over the world Ooh. okay hmm this is a very huge one i think to become an idea if this is truly a possibility in our AI driven world, I would like to join me as a crime scene investigator and ask the typical question, cui bono? This is Latin for who benefits from it. And I think this idea that AI might just take over the world and rule us over us as humans is merely the idea of people gaining marketing and reach out of this idea, then it is truly a real possibility that awaits us. And yes, of course, it is a very mighty technology and we have to be careful. But before AI could take over the world, it just needs will and impetus. That means it needs the will of taking over the world. Okay, you could argue that we build AI from our image as humans and we as humans tend to overrule other humans. So yes, you might be right. AI might be biased in the way that it thrives for ruling the world. But is there this impetus? I think this is merely something um, we we tend to make AI and other technologies human-like. So we talk about, let's say, ChatGPT thinking something about something, but we just put over our human characteristics to the technology. And we're doing the same, in my humble opinion, if we think that AI could just take over the world. Now, I think the real problem here is that we, if we talk about AI commanding armies to conquer the world, I think we forget this group, the hidden criminals in the underground using AI and other technology to hack systems, to, to place deep fakes into our media and to to foster the disaster. So we have to stay very aware of humans misusing the technology and not so much of AI itself conquering the world. Okay, but before we talk so bad about these cute animals, I would like to talk with you also on the parakeets. And of course, Homo automaticus is more about the parakeets in the room saying the happy and the good things about AI than about the doom of things. So, of course, medicine. For me personally, the usage of AI in medicine is one of the most important topics. And here we have one of the brilliant examples of AI for good. The Chinchpada Mission Hospital in rural India. If that's very, very difficult to search for medical personnel there. Uh, let it be doctors or nurses or whoever. It is really difficult to attract them to that very far off rural area. And they apply some AI assisted doctors or even calling it a medical bot for diagnosis and so on. And they're so happy as for the very first time they have enough power to give enough diagnosis to the patients and to treat their patients better and better and better each and every day using AI. The other one, and my personal prediction here is that AI has the power to bring academia to the rural areas of the world. So wherever we have children and young people thriving for 
education for academic education, but without possibilities, I think using AI and what we see right now in AI fostered education, using bots as tutors, as academic tutors, and with the ability of the AI to adapt to the niveau, the nivel of the of the pupils. I personally think my prediction for AI is that this will change everything. We have the possibility for very, very low cost to bring academic education to rural parts of the world and therefore live this treasure of intelligence of human of human ingenuity in that areas just a very small example the other day i made the homework with my 10th grade elder daughter she's not that small as we saw in the image before and now Physics and Coulomb's law is now one of her tasks in physics. I don't want to bore you with the details, but uh, this is just uh, an extract of the tasks at hand she had to do and uh, some very difficult physical math and equations here. And we tried to use ChatGPT for help, uh, not to give it the whole task, but to have an idea what the task could be about. And it was very easy, just we put in the the, the screenshot of that task and um, ChatGPT gave us a very, very accurate, good idea of how Coulomb's law and constant could solve this equation. So in the, in the uh, right after it, we were able to ask ChatGPT more about the details and we could, in a conversation, build up her and my knowledge as well about Coulomb's law and uh, this part of physics very fast and very accurate. And I think this was a very, very good example on how AI tutors could help us with education, with getting ideas on our modern world. Okay, so this was a very small part, but we see AI as a driver in research and academia very lot. This curve you saw at the beginning, this vertical curve of development, is also fostered by AI's possibility to summarize, to bring out key thoughts of research papers of whole books in the nutshell of one or two or three sentences or paragraphs and so research is gaining speed and speed each day more and i think this is one of the yeah together with medicine and together with education with basic or academic education in research and research for all kinds of topics this is the third most powerful force of ai Okay, in your personal life and in your business life, I think, as I see it in my enterprise, in my company, you will be able to spend more time and focus on the things you love. You won't have to do all the tedious tasks again. You can outsource them to the AI, to the bots, to the AI agents and concentrate only on what gives you pleasure, what gives you enlightenment or whatever you call it and this tremendous force is up to us to use it and to embrace it andrew Engie stated a couple of years ago ai is the new electricity and i couldn't agree more in this case i think now right now we're talking about ai oh and have you seen this new this brand new tool and have you seen this video from open ai oh no in a couple of years, AI will simply be part of everything. All, all technology, everything we have around us will be powered and interwoven with AI. So we won't talk about AI. We will talk about the next steps of our evolution. And before we come to an end, we have to focus here on, I think AI has the capacity to free all our very human 
ideas, ingenuity in our brains and to open up a whole new world for us. Just to put it in a nutshell or of a slide, I think AI is very good at producing video, images, audio, text and on conversation, in education or giving advice, giving advice to you and your company and do summaries and research as we saw. But the last point here is its recent integration in the brains and the operating part of robotics. And I won't end without showing you this recent video. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great, can you put them there? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I... So this is the result if you put some very advanced generative AI into the brain of a robot. And very, very interesting things will come this summer. I'm really sure, and long this year. So before we end this session, thank you so much. And you will find this one here on the Amazons globally as an ebook, as a Kindle edition, as a paperback or as a hardcover, if you like. Just go to this URL and you will find the book. The price is set with 0 0.99 cents for the ebook, but this is that's, uh, just the pre-order price. We will raise the price for the ebook um, from on tomorrow to 7.99. And uh, then there is a, another price for the paperback and the hardcover. And so the last thing I would like to tell you, thank you so much for joining in, celebrating this new book about our AI driven future and see you on the next one. Thank you.